I hope you can hear me. Usually at the beginning of a year, we make resolutions. I'll be 90, I don't make them anymore. <laughs> you know, I notice that as I get older, I see not as well as I used to. I hear less than I used to. I walk less than I used to. But I find that in my spirit is stronger love for Jesus. And when we had a uh, family reunion this summer, we were celebrating our 65th anniversary. I said to them, I had a chance to preach to my family. I said, I want to tell you the good decisions I made to encourage you. I'm not going to tell you about the foolish decisions. That's between God and me. But we had a wonderful time. The greatest decision that I made was to enter into the kingdom of God through the Messiah. And I want to talk about the kingdom of God and how to enter into it. Some begin their journey through a philosophical insight. C.S. Lewis was an atheist. And he uh, wrote this that I want to share with you. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got the idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. Thus, in the very act of trying to prove that God did not exist, in other words, that the whole of reality was senseless, I found I was forced to assume that one part of reality, namely my idea of justice, was full of sense. He had to come to that conclusion. Consequently, atheism turned out to be too simple. If a whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. So he had this insight and later he became a believer in the Lord. And he said, I believe in biblical Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, because by it, I see everything else. Reason can help us to begin understanding the reality of God. But it takes a revelation from God of the scriptures by the Holy Spirit of God to get us into the kingdom of God. I've selected Matthew 16, verse 13, 21 for our text. Listen to the word of God. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? Who am I? As the people would say. So they said, Some say John the Baptist come from the dead. Some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeshua answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Yeshua the Messiah. I want to expound this scripture. And I have two major points. 
First, we must understand the true identity of Yeshua to enter God's kingdom. We have to understand who he is in order to understand that through him we have eternal life. Secondly, we must understand the present and future purposes of God's kingdom to relate to it. So let's look at this scripture. First, we must understand the true identity of the king to enter God's kingdom. We cannot enter the kingdom of God with a misunderstanding or a limited understanding of Jesus. Look with me at verse 13 of our text. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I the son of man am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Many of the Jewish people of Jesus' day acknowledged his goodness and miracle power, but thought of him as just one of the prophets. There are even some rabbis today, some Jewish leaders that think well of Jesus, but not enough. Rabbi John Fisher wrote about Yeshua in his book, Examining the Life and Teachings of Jesus. Here is a man who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village. He worked in a carpenter's shop until he was 30. And then for three years was an itinerary preacher. He never wrote a book, he never held an office, he never owned a home, he never had a family, he never went to college, he never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He never did one of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. While still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him, his friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed on a cross between two thieves. His executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had on earth, which was when he, while he was dying. And that was his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down, laid in a borrowed tomb through the pity of a friend. Over 1900 wide centuries have come and gone. Today is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. I am far within the mark, the rabbi wrote, when I say that all the armies that ever marched and all the navies that were ever built and all the parliaments that were ever sat and all the kings that have ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as the one solitary life. So there are those who are reconsidering Jesus. They think of him as a good man, as an effective man, as an influential man. But to say nice things about Jesus as a human being is not enough to enter the kingdom of God. You must acknowledge his nature, that he is the son of God. C.S. Lewis wrote again, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis said that is the one thing we must not say if a man who was merely a man said the sort of things Jesus said, he would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a post egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet 
and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great teacher. You see, it's important to understand that Jesus has not left us any other option. He did not intend to. He was the Son of God. It's important to understand that because his one sacrifice avails for all of the human race. What value this man must have had that he was the infinite Son of God became a man. And so his one sacrifice was sufficient. I love that verse in 1 John that says, little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is a propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. This one sacrifice, this one Lamb of God that was, was crucified, his life is of such great value that it can include the whole world's salvation if men will repent and turn to him. Now it takes a divine revelation to understand the deity of Jesus. It doesn't come from human reasoning or human understanding. Listen to verse 15 of our text. Yeshua said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Yeshua answered and said to him, blessed you are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So the knowledge of the deity of the Messiah comes from the inspiration of God the Father. Now you might ask your question, well suppose I don't feel the witness of God in my heart. Maybe God is overlooking me. Maybe I don't hear in my mind. Is there any hope for me? Yes, there is. Listen to Yeshua in Matthew 7, 7 to 8. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks it will be opened. I told you this illustration before comes from my experience. In Vermont, I was a pastor and a young couple visited our church and my practice was to visit them. And so I visited them and I talked to them about the good news of Yeshua and I asked his wife if she was ready to accept Jesus. I didn't ask him because I could tell from his body language that he was resentful. So I thought I would ask the wife. She said yes. I led her in prayer. Then I said to the man, his name is Russ, are you ready to accept Yeshua? He said, look, my wife's not a well-educated woman. I'm a PhD in botany. I'm an atheist. I don't sense any reality in God. I said, do you like to do research work? He said, of course. I said, can I do a research project with you? Can I ask God to reveal himself to you? He laughed. He said, sure, why not? So I prayed, Lord, you know this man. He doesn't sense your reality. Would you reveal yourself to him? A few months later, he came to my office and he was quite excited. You know, as an intellectual, he was quite quiet when I first talked to him, but he excited. He was speaking a little loud. I know there's a God. I know there's a God. I know there's a God. I said, how do you know? 
He said, I was studying some desert flowers and it hit me like an express train. There's a designer, there's a God. But I don't know if this God is the God of the New Testament. I said, well, let's ask him. He became a believer and was baptized in the name of Jesus. So, if you don't sense the reality of God, you can still seek for him. In fact, it tells us in the Jewish prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. Listen to this. This is God speaking. For I know the thoughts that I have toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me. And I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. When you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord. So I can say to someone, if you're willing, God is willing, and he has a great plan for your life. I know that by experience. I had very little prospects as a young man, as a high school student. I flunked out of high school. I also had poor vision, and I had a serious case of asthma. And I said to the Lord one day, Lord, I would, I have no future, but I would ask you, Lord, to save yourself embarrassment because I bear your name. Take me to heaven. I was 14 and a half. And the Lord said, I want to show you what I can do with your life. And he's given me a blessed life. I could share that with my family in August. I said, the scripture says, he that soweth to the flesh, sow of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And I can thank God that my major decisions were to trust the Lord. And I wanted them to know that and to surrender their lives to the Lord. So in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must know the identity, the true identity of Yeshua. If you can't figure it out on your own, you can ask God to show it to you. I remember going back to my church in Omaha for an anniversary. And there was a businessman who came up to me and he said, the last Sunday you were here, you gave an invitation. You said, if you're unwilling to be a believer, are you willing to say to God, I'm willing to be made willing? He said, I was unwilling. But I said, yes, Lord, if you exist, make me willing. He became a believer. So don't be discouraged. Seek the Lord and you'll find him. What a wonderful God we have. Think of God loving to forgive, wanting to forgive sinners. Wow, we need forgiveness all of our lives. And the Lord loves us. Can you imagine the holy God, the righteous God, the perfect God is willing to forgive those who sin? We all make mistakes. He's willing to forgive if we ask him. Secondly, we must understand the present and future purposes of God's kingdom to relate to it. We need to understand that God has a purpose for his kingdom in this age and in the age to come. The king's present purpose is to build his universal church. The church is not a Jewish church, nor is it a Gentile church. It is a universal church. Yeshua said in verse 18 of our text, and I also say to you that you are Peter. Peter means a rock, but a little rock. 
And he uses two different Greek words for rock here. Peter, a little rock. And on this rock, a larger rock, another word. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The large foundational rock of the church is a confession of the gospel of the Messiah. And then God said to Peter in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The keys of the kingdom is the gospel, which it was the confession of Peter. Thou art the Messiah, the son of the living God. When we get a person to that position where he is willing to confess that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we will have a person bound for heaven rather than bound for Hades. What a wonderful salvation that is. This is a simple confession of faith. We don't have to be perfect. In fact, we come as we are, and he accepts us. Now, if a church loses its message, it has no reason for existing. Again, I have a, a real life story. Uh, in Vermont, my church that I pastored had no off street parking. It was a little building we had 49 members, 100 attended. But there was a Presbyterian church nearby, a few streets away, that had seven acres of land, enough to build, expand, and to park cars. But you know, the pastor there felt that the form of the church is over. The traditional church is no longer in existence of value. And so he created a new kind of church calling it the wave of the future. They only met once a month, what they called a festival. But during the rest of the month, they divided the congregation into committees, a committee on social action, committee on political action. The pastor became a member of parliament in Vermont. And so that was his solution. And they started at the same time we started. And so I had breakfast with Bill Hollister. And I said, you know, we're going two different directions. You're going the direction of social gospel. You no longer believe the message of the cross is relevant. But we're going to build our church on the message of the gospel of Christ. And I wonder what it will be like 10 years from now. What will be the outcome? Well, 10 years passed. Our church grew to 600 members. His church sold their property to our church. And we relocated the church and they now have a new building on that land. Plenty of parking. When you lose a message, you lose the purpose of the church. I don't know why people want to go to a church when the pastor doesn't believe in the gospel of Christ. I mean, that's like spending your money and for no value. Now, once the church age is completed, see, he's building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, but once the church is finished, completed, there is a future purpose, and that's to redeem Israel as God's nation. In verse 20 of our text, then Yeshua commanded his disciples, 
that they should not tell anyone that he's a messiah. Maybe you wonder why he would do that. Why did he say, don't tell them that I am the Messiah? Why? Well, it was because insurrection against Rome was in the air and the people were ready to take him by force and make him king. Remember, they wanted to do that. But that was not the purpose of his first coming. They were ready to follow him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but not as the lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world through his resurrection and his death and resurrection. You see, if Yeshua had not become the lamb of God and provided a redemption for sinners, the kingdom of God would have no citizens there'd be no salvation. And so his first purpose was to come to be the sacrifice for your sins and mine so God could forgive us and cleanse us and transform us and give us his spirit. It's God, the, God, the Holy Spirit. So they were ready to follow him, but he had to die for sinners. Now, he will return to redeem Israel as a nation, and he will sit on the throne of David forever. Some theologians have rejected this literal interpretation of biblical prophecy and advocate the allegorical method of interpretation. They spiritualize away the future blessings of Israel, leaving them with their lament. They strip Israel of God's promises of future blessing. They see no future for the nation of Israel within the new earth and new heavens. They erroneously believe that the church is Israel. They ignore what the angel Gabriel told Mary. Remember that in Luke 1 verse 30, the angel said unto her, unto Mary, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast find, found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua, which means salvation. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Notice the angel was saying that God was going to give him the throne of David. That has nothing to do with the church. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. So the kingdom of Israel, the day will come when they shall come out of Zion, heavenly Zion, a deliverer that shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. You know, God loves Israel. It, Paul said that God stretches his hands out to a disobedient and stubborn nation. But the day will come when Israel will proclaim him as a true Messiah. You know, I love Jewish humor. It always has a point. Let me repeat one. Well, according to this story, things were going badly for Israel. The economy was in a tailspin. Inflation was getting higher, and immigrants were flooding in from all over. Problems, problems, problems. Well, so what to do? So the Knesset held a special session to bring up a solution. After several hours of talk without progress, one member stood up and said, quiet everyone, I got it. The solution to all our problems, what? We'll declare war on the United States. 
Everyone is shouting at once, you're nuts. That's crazy. He said, hear me out. We declare war, we lose. The United States does what it always does when she defeats a country. She rebuilds everything, our highways, our airports, shipping ports, schools, hospitals, factories, and they give us money and send us food. Our problems will be solved. Shaw said another member, that's if we lose, but what if we win? <laughs> but you know, Israel's survival does not depend on the United States. It depends on the line of the tribe of Judah. But you know, Israel will be a nation, holy, forgiven. God has given so many promises to Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, says the Lord. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them from Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, they broke, remember, the golden calf. They disobeyed God's word. But he said, I will forgive their sin and remember it no more. I'll write on their hearts my laws and on their minds. And they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. What a wonderful promise. Now, in conclusion, you know, a pastor has to learn to stand up, speak up, and shut up. Amen. <laughs> I heard an amen there. Is there another amen? <laughs> Today we're still living in the age of the universal church. And everyone is invited to come in to the church of Christ, of Messiah. For he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 13 to 14. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, which is the allegory for the church. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. I love the fact that we have Jewish believers here and Gentile believers. We're all baptized with the same Spirit of God. We are all forgiven. We're brothers and sisters. And we are to love one another as Christ loved us. I've come to love you as a church. I don't know if this will be my last sermon or not. But I love you and I appreciate you. You are people of God, and you demonstrate the love of God in many ways. So I want you to know that that's how I feel. An honor to come, that you would listen to this old man and be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.